This unit involves physics and advanced algebra standards. The physics standards are kinematics, which are essentially just the equations of motion, distance, velocity, and acceleration as something moves through two dimensions. It can be a projectile, but it doesn't have to. And at the same time, the advanced algebra standards are just equations in context. And so what that means is take some of this math and put it into a real world context, whatever that may be. So that gave me a lot of freedom to decide what that was going to mean. And so rather than just having it be mathematical equations and just having it be some algebra, it was really fun to be able to use a student suggestion, which is to work on pumpkin chunking. And that lets us do everything you might want to do in a science or math unit. You get to learn theory, you get to learn mathematics, then you get to do experimentation and designing and building, and you get to go in the field and have a big field day. So as we've seen in the videos, um, Punk and Chunkin' is pretty cool. It's using modern materials, modern know-how. They're using computer um, design programs as well as just ingenuity to throw these pumpkins for competition. And so we're actually going to do the same thing. We're going to have, later on in the year when we finish this unit, we're going to have a big pumpkin chunking competition. And it's going to be pretty much open design. You can throw them by hand. You can throw them by sling. You can throw them off a catapult. If you design an air cannon, I will allow you to use an air cannon. But any of the design methods that you've seen in the videos are open game. So what we're going to do after we've learned some of the physics is you guys are going to have time in class to design and build your catapults. And I'm going to review your designs to make sure A, that they work, and B, that no one's going to get hurt. But this is going to be totally driven by you. The kids have probably actually seen these equations before, and I mentioned that when I'm teaching it to them, that you've seen parabolas before, you've solved quadratic equations. Most of the kids I teach are already pretty well schooled in the kind of algebra we're doing. But a lot of them have a really superficial understanding, or maybe they've forgotten it. And so I bring it up in terms of review. Here's something you already know. Let's talk about what it means. And even if they don't actually know it, they're going to know it by the end of the unit. So I'm able to take that approach because I'm going to work through everything that's in the math anyway. But by framing it as review and application, it makes it a different take. I'm not making them learn equations. I'm not making them learn the vertex anymore. I'm encouraging them to think about what they mean. When we shoot a projectile, many things are happening to it. You're forcing it forward and upward. So it's going to have two components, which we'll call x for horizontal and y for vertical motion. Those are going to be our axes. And so it's going to have some x motion, which is how fast it moves forward. And it's going to have some y motion, which is how fast it begins to move upward. Will it move upward at that speed forever, do you think? No. No. What's it going to do? It's going to fall. It'll, eventually, it'll decrease and it'll eventually fall. Absolutely. What's going to make that happen? Gravity. Gravity is always pulling us back down, right? So even if I throw something upward, it comes back to me. Here's the cool thing. X and Y motion, two-dimensional, can actually be disassociated. So I can treat the X as separate from the Y. So when I throw something forward and up, and it follows a path through the air, it's actually, for mathematical purposes, moving forward at a constant speed, while it also goes up, slows down, and comes back down. And if I combine those forward, while also up and down, I get the path that it follows. Now the cool thing is that path is an actual mathematical equation. It's called a parabola. You've certainly seen the equation before. It's also called a quadratic equation. So a quadratic equation models a parabola, and it has an x squared term an x term and a constant with no x at all. Each of those also has a coefficient, a, b, and c, that modifies that. So what does a, a quadratic equation look like when you graph it? I don't like this graph. A u, usually. Sort of a, a nicely curving u. Yeah, you guys have seen that before. So I'm going to draw that shape up here, because I'm saving this for something special. So usually a parabolic path looks something like that, a nice, evenly curving U. But what is the path of our projectile going to look like? Like that? It's flipped upside down. So what that means is, on our equation, A would be negative. That's a mathematical implication of what we're learning. So our path is going to start wherever we are. We're going to call that the origin. 
and it's going to move up and over until it hits the ground at the target area. So there are several important points on a parabola that we need to think about. I can see three that would really matter on this parabola. What three points? Can anybody name one? The origin. Origin, absolutely, that's one. What's another one? I saw a hand. The end point. Absolutely, the end point. That's where it's going to land. That's really important. So we've got the, the start and the end point. What's the third? The highest. The highest point, absolutely, as far up as it goes. Beautiful. So where it ends and the highest point. Aside from those, do we really need more information to decide what the parabola is? No. Not so much. So if we know the origin, the end point, and how high it goes, we know everything we've really got to know to get our projectile where we want it. So we can actually solve this equation. We're not going to fully solve it right now. But we're going to learn some things about it. So when x is 0 at the starting point, what's y? 0. zero. So one of the many points on this parabola is 0, 0, which looks like a person. Um, what would we call the distance from the start point to where it hits the ground? What might you call that? What do we call how far a weapon will shoot or how far something will fly through the air? Range. Range. So I would like to call this distance r for range. So what is this point? What's x here? Mm -mm. x is r. x is r, yeah. But y is, you were right about that, y is what? How high is it? Zero. zero. So another point on the graph is r and zero. What would you call this distance to the, to the top? We're going to call that y max. So what's this point? What's x here? r over 2. r over 2. It's half of r, isn't it? A projectile is going to reach its maximum height at half the distance. It's a good insight. So we're going to be at r over 2. And then whatever y max is. So if we use those three points and we substitute x and y values in, we can actually find out what a, b, and c are. So if we do that, we can determine the exact parabolic path of our projectile. Now, there's another way to look at parabolae. I like this one better. The most important thing is he really cares about the kids. He kind of starts with the students and what they need and then brings the curriculum to them, which is a little different from what a lot of teachers do. Sometimes they will just take the curriculum and teach it, teach the standards, and then the kids either get it or they don't. But he's always interested in um, finding out what they know, what they don't know, where he can stretch them. And so his lesson plans are all over. They, um, he starts out with a plan, but they're always flexible so that he can go up or down. And so by using this simple algebra, either standard form or quadratic form, I know everything there is to know mathematically about the path of a real moving projectile which has a complicated motion. So math and physics are really working together here to give us pretty impressive knowledge from very simple measurements. In this unit, I do a lot of informal assessment. It's pretty easy for me to do because the kids are working on um, design and I'm able to see what they're doing. It'll be out on their desk. They'll either be working in groups or alone. And I've got time to come up and look at each piece of work and ask questions. And so if a child has designed a catapult arm, for example, and the one arm is short and one arm is long, which it should be, I'm able to ask them why that is, and I can assess whether they understand the concept from how they answer that question. But by making the design process last a week, I've got time to check in with every kid two or three times, and that lets me get enough assessments. Today we're going to work on the design of your catapults, and by design I mean I need to see a detailed drawing. I want to approve what you're building, and so it's safe and so it's functional. So I need to see what it's going to look like. So what I want you guys to do is work together in your groups if you're in a group, work individually. Um, this is your time to work, and I'm going to come around and check what you're doing. If you have internet devices, phones, computers, feel free to use them. I want to see, I want to see you searching. I want to see you coming up with ideas of your own and testing them. And I'm going to walk around. Don't know. We can look at some rubber online, see what you can get, like cheap at Walmart or something. Oh,
Here's ours. Okay, what's it look like? It's a, um, it's got a base. Okay. And then it's got two four by fours upright against each other. Okay. And it's got a bar and we pull it down and attach it to some bungee cords. Very good. Pull it down and let it go and it hits the bar and flies forward. Okay, so this works again like an onager. But it's interesting, you got the, the arm up high like that, so you get a lot more range of motion. You know a usual one has it at the bottom, and so it can only move 90 degrees. That lets yours move 180 or more. And this is that model you guys had, right? Yeah. What's it look like? Do you have a good picture of it? Yeah, we have a bunch of those models. Oh, yeah. The classic, yeah. Classic trebuchet. All right, guys. So I'd like you three to come up here and try the simulator. This is pretty neat. It's virtual trebuchet, and it lets you type in numbers that represent the catapult and the projectile you're going to shoot. And then you can actually hit submit, and it'll calculate the trajectory you're going to get, and it'll show you the shot. So I'd like you guys to come up here and play with it and see if you get the performance you want. You can specify all the lengths and weights on your catapult, and then this, when you hit submit, it will give you your shot, and it'll give you your range and height, because it's actually solving this equation we talked about a while ago, and it's actually finding range, it's finding the Y max, and it's calculating the total path, and you'll see that when it runs. So go ahead and give it a shot, and let's see what your catapult will do. Make sure you put in 45 for the, or the 25 for the weight. So start with your, your first idea for weight. So 25? Right uh -huh. here? Yeah. Are you sure go for we'll see if 25, five? we don't know. We'll see if 25 is enough. That's why we do this. So it should be pretty interesting. Do you have all your lengths put in? Yeah. Yeah. All right, and you're going to shoot a golf ball. A golf ball, great. So is our. Wait, why is our length of like short arm really short? Okay. See? The short, this is the short arm. Yeah, right I'm here. saying, why is it like really because you don't want it long. long you don't want it longer than the long arm. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying, I'm saying. You see, you see mm -hmm. our short arm. It's only one seventy-five. And the and long, then arm's long arm is eight. eight. So I don't. The long like, arm has the projectile on it. This simulation was cut short because it used number of loops. So I, I think it's because of the weights. Let's change yeah. change the mass of. Weight. That simulator was actually found by one of my students during the design phase of the lessons. Um, we were working on coming up with the right size and shape for our catapults, and on his own, while looking for something to help him do that, he found this simulator, and it was really, really good for what he wanted it to do, which was to help him judge the length of the arm, the amount of weight he needed. It was so good that I immediately used it in class. I think the next day I brought it in and pulled it up on the screen and let the kids use it. And it gives them a range and a height, which relates immediately to that parabolic equation we've already learned. So now that you have approved designs, um, we're going to start the build. And this is going to take a week or so, I expect, maybe longer. We're going to see where that takes us. And this is a design process. I have approved your design. Does that mean it's going to work the first time you try it? No. It will probably not work for the majority of you because in design, things don't always work out. I could miss something, you could miss something, or it just might not work the way we expected it to. So after the first build, we're gonna do some minor testing and you're probably gonna have changes to make. So I expect that. There's no failure here. There's just failure to complete. So as long as you keep working, it'll eventually work and we'll have something to shoot. So this is essentially tool time. We're gonna use safety procedures. If you want a tool, you have to ask me for it, especially if it's a cutting tool and we're gonna work together safely and we're gonna get our stuff built. So let's begin that. So go for it, what are you gonna do there? Uh, I wanna cut this and fasten it so it's like, mm -hmm. it stays still. It's gonna brace your sling? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. so the slings, you know, it's gonna get duct taped right up here. Good stuff. So I'll hold it and you cut it. How does it move? It should it be like that or? Mm, how do you mean? Well, is it gonna go, it's gonna go like sideways up against it like that and then we'll drill in. I think we should use, yeah, maybe the end. If we cut this end square okay. below the eye bolt, you should have a good place to attach. All right, so let's make that cut. Yeah. Um, and then we'll measure again to do the bottom cut. Be shorter. Yep. All right, I'll hold, you hack. All 
I'm a former engineer and I consider the design process to be really enjoyable and a lot of kids are not in that mindset. It may be intimidating to know that you're going to build something that may not work and if it doesn't work everybody's going to know because you're going to test it in class where people see it. And so I try to really discuss with them that the goal is not necessarily to make something perfect ever, let alone perfect on the first try and that you're always improving. So we get the idea of iteration, which is where you test and rebuild and test and rebuild. And it, it's still difficult for some of them, especially the more shy ones, to realize that they're going to make something imperfect and other people are going to know. But over time, especially as they see some of the outgoing ones try it, and you know something breaks or it doesn't shoot, and we all laugh, and then we fix it, and it shoots better the next time, sort of by osmosis almost, they absorb this idea that failure is not Final failure is a process of improvement. So why don't we flex it down and screw it in place? And then we'll just use the leverage to wrench those around. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, All let's, right, so let's just So we'll get like somebody to hold it. Mm -hmm. And hold um, let me make some. Yeah, I got you. So right yep, there. good. Right there. Yeah, make all four I think. Right there. If it works, it works. Yep, yeah, it, it worked. All right. Yeah, you can see those. Let's pre-drill those. Where's the last one? There? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Let me see if I can square it along. Okay. Look, it runs right along here. That's oh, perfect. Wow. That, might be, yeah, that might be easier than... We'll need to put some stops in. Do you want to put some screws in to give it different heights? Like mean? screw stops. During the, the field day, the kids are taking really, really simple data. They're pacing off the range, the distance the projectile shoots, and with a stopwatch for the ones that shoot far enough for the timing to be meaningful, we're also counting hang time. And through an equation that we use in physics, the hang time can actually allow you to calculate the height as well, because gravity is what determines hang time. And so we've really measured the two things we need for our parabola, which is height and range. And so using that, we can create the equation of the parabola, and that lets us know everything about the path. From start to finish, we know the whole shape. At any given time or distance, we know exactly where the projectile is. And the kids were amazed that with two simple readings like that, they could know everything about it. Oh yeah. Splash. That's great. Pace it off. Big steps. How many paces? 60. <laughs> 60 paces. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Notice uh your weight arm is the long one and your firing arm is the short one. What did the simulator tell us that might do? Uh, exactly what it just did. So I think what we might want to do is maybe try flipping it next time, put the hook on the other end. We might get a better shot. Well, I definitely learned that the design process in your head is much different than the actual building process. And I really did learn the physics of behind it. We did learn a lot from the momentum to the projectile motion of them that we're able to calculate the angle of release, the parabolic motion, and the amount of speed and momentum that one of the pumpkins had that we launched from the catapult. Here, hand me that. That would hurt. All right, back it out. Lou, you can let go now. It's got a safety rope on it. All right. All right, we are preparing to fire. Everybody get out of the fire zone. Press 
Preston, don't stand there. Yeah. All right, wait for me. You guys ready? Yep. All right, we are ready. Firing, firing, firing. Firing in three, two, one. Spike. <laughs> The event really taught me a lot. It taught me that from the design process, which seemed to be surefire, to the actual building process, it's two completely different things. The building process turns out to be much harder than before. And the, um, the event taught me a lot in the fact of physics, where we were able to actually calculate the trajectory, the angle of release, the momentum, and the equation of the parabola created from the trajectory, we were able to calculate all that from one of our pumpkin shoots, from the data we were able to gather from the time it took to hit the ground and from a few other measurements that we had. And it was just really interesting to learn all of that and actually put that into a real world, real world situation. All right, guys, that was pretty awesome. Um, I certainly had fun on Pumpkin Chunkin'. It was a good day. And we actually found out how far your catapults would shoot compared to what we had predicted. Uh, were they longer range or shorter range than we thought? A lot shorter. Um, let's name a few reasons for that because there were multiple. What's one reason that a catapult didn't shoot as far as it should have? The counterweight. The counterweight we had to change on the big one. The counterweight was too heavy for the catapult, so we had to bring it down. So right away, they, were, they had less power than they thought. Were there any other reasons? Yeah. Uh, the bungee cords weren't powerful enough to sling the two by six and throw the pumpkin in the air. Yeah, that, that arm was just way too heavy for the bungee cords. Um, best memories, anybody have one? I'd have to say when we launched over the baseball field. Yep, we got it over the fence, that was beautiful.